So our speaker is Grace LeCure. She is the Raptor Survey Coordinator for the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. Um, more specifically, she's been heavily involved with the Indiana Department of Natural Resources Barn Owl Nest Box Program. Last winter, she completed nest box checks on over 300 sites um, throughout the state of Indiana. Tonight, she will share the results of her work. So with that, I will turn it over to Grace. All right, I'm gonna share my screen and make sure everyone can hear me and see me and whatnot. Can everyone who's on the other side, who's in person, hear me as well? Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. All right, fantastic. Finally got this up and running. All right, everyone, hello. As Robert mentioned, my name is Grace LeCure. I am the Raptor Survey Coordinator for the Indiana DNR. And I'm gonna be giving you some fun facts about barn owls, some tips about how to find them in Illinois, a little bit of background information about the Indiana DNR and about the Nest Box program. So I titled this talk, The Endangered Beauty of the Midwest, because in Indiana, they are state endangered species, so it's really, really important that we need to focus on these guys. All right, so starting off, I just wanted to give a little introduction about me. I grew up in Northern California and then came out here to Indiana to get my degree at Indiana University, go Hoosiers. <laughs> I got my degree in biology, where I then joined the Indiana Non-Game Bird Program earlier that year, and I've been working under the state ornithologist, which is bird biologist and I've been working as the Raptor Survey Coordinator ever since then. So I thought I'd dive into a little bit about how the non-game fund works in Indiana. I did some research about Illinois, and Illinois is about the same, it's the same thing, just titled a different way. And I think it's really important to kind of really enhance how non-game funds work and how the government and the DNR can use those funds for specifically birds. So as you can see from this chart, this is for the Indiana DNR's Division of Fish and Wildlife funding. As you can see, 47% of it goes to wildlife and sport fish restoration. So that's gonna be specifically habitat management for fish, game birds, deer, et cetera. 29% goes to the license funds. So whenever you wanna trap or hunt or fish, you have to buy a license to do that. So that goes to it. And if you can see at the very, very bottom corner, only point five, seven percent goes to the non-game fund. So that includes birds and mammals as well. So like I mentioned, all money received from licenses, hunting, fishing, trapping, all that goes to the game species. Money received from taxes from ammunition and firearms, that also goes to the game species. So you may be wondering, how do non-game species get funded at all? Well, just like Indiana, Illinois has the same thing, but the only way that we get funded is donations specifically to the non-game from via our tax forms or the DNR website. And in your guys' case, I wrote it down, it's not the non-game fund for Illinois, but it's called the Wildlife Preservation Fund. So essentially that's the same thing that we have, but it's just called something different. So we get donations from the public and then the federal government matches that. So for Indiana's instance, if you donate $5, we then get matched $14 from the federal government. So that's kind of how it works, just to kind of explain how difficult it can be to really advocate for these non-game species, specifically birds. So I wanted to give you guys some fun facts about barn owls so you can really appreciate all the work that went into this. So they were listed as endangered in Indiana in 1984. 
And then I'd like to also mention their habitats. They love grassland and prairie habitats. We don't have too much grassland left here in Indiana, so they kind of have been really moving more towards farmland areas, but ideally grassland would be perfect. So when you think of owls, you probably think of the hooting, hoo, hoo, hoo. But barn owls actually don't hoot, they scream. So they have a really loud screech noise that's almost terrifying to hear at night. It's almost like something is coming out of the woods and is gonna get you. It makes you really realize why we have myths about ghosts and stuff. Cause if you saw something white, just go through the woods and you hear a scream, That'd terrify me too. <laughs> so they are expert hunters of agricultural pests, such your mice, voles, moles, occasionally bats and small birds, and very rarely lizards and snakes. They are expert hunters because of their talons and their grip. They have a very impressive 300 pounds of force per square inch of their talons. They are very strong. Even as chicks, it's, they are very difficult. If they get a hold of you, it's really hard to pull them away. Something really interesting about them is that they have asymmetrical ears. So that means that their ears are uneven from each other. I tried to show that here in this photo where one ear is slightly higher than the other, even though the eyes are directly across from each other. That really helps them navigate their hearing a lot because even though they have really big eyes, they rely a lot on their hearing. They can't move their eyes around in their eye socket like we can. We can look from left to right without moving our head. Owls can't do that. Their eyes are attached to their skulls, so they have to move their heads around, hence why you think of owls turning their head 180. Barn owls are really neat because they have 14 vertebrae in their neck. Humans only have seven, so that's why they're able to do almost a hundred, like 360, I think the exact number is 324 degrees is what they can reach. And their feathers really, really make them expert hunters. So barn owls actually have the quietest flight in any owl. And that is because of the shape of their feathers. I have one here to kind of show if you can see on zoom, but it's very rounded. Typical feathers are very pointed and that really makes that flapping sound. Whereas this rounded barn owl feather is gonna like let the air just slice off of it. I brought this whooping crane feather as well to kind of show the difference in the point, which is gonna make that really loud flap and the nice circle of the barn owl feather, which makes them almost soundless as they fly, which means that those mice and voles can't hear them before they get scooped up. So I'd like to give a little bit of the history of the barn owl population in Indiana. So we decided to start the nest box program in 1986 due to the decline in population. And then we started doing reoccurring nest surveys in the early 2000s, just to kind of monitor how they've been going. I kind of hid the results at the end, so it won't spoil it, but this is an idea to give you kind of how the population has been doing in the past couple of years. When we started the nest box program, there was only 11 barn owl nests reported in the entire state of Indiana. And then I'm not sure why, but we took a big leap away from reporting barn owl nests. So then we only had 14 the next one, pretty stable around 17, and then a huge jump in 2017 with 42 barn owl nests. And I covered this guy just so you can't see the answer to what we found during this next nest box survey. So I'd like to give you a little bit more information about if you see a barn owl, how to identify them. So I split apart this really awesome photo from the Audubon Society. So we have the male, on the left and the female on the right. The biggest difference to tell them apart is usually their size. If you get two next to each other and there's one that's a little bit smaller, that's gonna be your male. Another thing that I like to help distinguish them is I like to say that females have makeup on because they have darker shading in their feathers around their eyes and down their beak. Usually their breasts are usually more darker rusty brown than the females my, or the males might have a more dusty, light coffee color. So if you see an owl that has a really, really dark face, but it's definitely a barn owl, more than likely you have a female. This picture really, really shows the differences, but I will admit it's really difficult sometimes to see the exact differences in person. So I've talked about these nest boxes and you're probably wondering what are nest boxes for owls anyway. You've probably seen bluebird boxes before. 
but foreign owl nest boxes are really, really special. So Indiana DNR specifically constructed a barn owl nest box that we have tampered with over the years to kind of mold for what barn owls need. So ideally it provides a safe place for them to nest away from predators like raccoons and great horned owls, as well as the weather. So what we do is we take these 32 inch wooden boxes with an access door on the side and we fit them in the interior of barns. You can see a picture on the right of a hole that we cut in the barn. So we cut the hole and place the next box right up to it. And we nail it down and that's essentially how it sits there. There's also exterior nest boxes like this one that you can see outside. We've noticed that Indiana barn owls are a little bit picky when it comes to nest boxes. So they don't really nest in these outside boxes, but in this one instance, this outside nest box did have a successful nest in it. So these nest boxes are really, really cool because we can use them a lot on private lands. 95% of our nest boxes are on private lands and only the other five are on DNR land, which is really, really awesome to have that opportunity to work with the public really successfully. So how the nest check occurs. So when I first would go into a barn, I would look for signs of an owl or an owl. We tried to do these nest box checks in the winter time to try to avoid any actively nesting owls, but occasionally there'd be an owl in the barn still or even in the nest box. So first I would look around for pellets, which are something that barn owls produce. They have two stomachs and they can't digest all the hard stuff in their second stomach. So things like bones, teeth, and fur get regurgitated in the form of a pellet. You can see one down here on the bottom right. I also looked for feathers. There was a research group in Chicago actually that was looking at the genetic differences of barn owls across the Midwest. So I collected feathers at every site that had barn owl feathers and set that off with the coordinates so they can do some really awesome research with that. We haven't gotten the results back, but I'm excited for them. And finally, whitewash, which just means poop. Big, big splatters of white poop can almost guarantee that you have some sort of raptor in there. May not be a barn owl, but it's definitely something big. So after I do a scope of the area, I go up to the nest box, which usually requires a ladder because they're about 15 to 20 feet up in the air. So I go up and I open the box via the access door that we have and I identify what's in the box. And if it's a barn owl nest, I age that nest, which I'll go through a little bit. There's a little fun mini game in here. In the bottom left, there's a photo and there's a barn owl in the photo. I'll give you guys a few seconds to kind of see if you can spot it. This one's a little bit easier, but sometimes these guys can really, really hide and make it really difficult to see them. But, yep, there he is. Barn owls would often just hang out in the raptors and even though they're stark white, that shadow would really conceal them and you would hardly even notice them if they're there. So aging a nest, which is a big part of what I did. If it was a barn owl nest, we have to age that nest. So that means we had to distinguish between pellets and pellet mass. So pellets, like I mentioned, are those individual tic-tac sized, tic-tac shaped, I should say. They're about four inches long, tic-tac shaped, pellets, they regurgitate into the box. And over time, as they nest in those pellets, they stamp them down and it becomes a pellet mass. You can kind of see the gradual stomping down through these pictures where this first one with this barn owl who's nesting, she has a lot of fresh pellets and you can tell that they're still individual pellets, relatively new. The second one with this nesting pair, they have stomp down portions, but there's also some shape to it. You can kind of see some maybe individual pellets. And then the final picture with the chicks, it is stomped down, completely a mat, really hard to pull out. So we use kind of those references to determine the age of the nest. So we look at the color of it. If it's really, really dark brown and moist, it's newer. Where if it's more gray, it's gonna be older. The thickness, about 
per nest, there's about two inches of pellet mass. So if I open a nest box and it's full, I can tell that there's been more than one nest in there. Or if I open a nest box and there's only about four inches, I can estimate that there is about one, maybe two nests in that box. And finally, level of decomposition. So sometimes I open a box, it's full, but the very top layer is full of bones. That means I can tell that it's really, really old and it's not a 2022 nest. So if it's really, really old, I did not classify that. I did make a report of it, but it was not mentioned in the 2022 report. So you probably have been seeing through all those photos. What do you do if there's a barn owl in the box? So if it's a solo adult, I usually clean carefully. Sometimes the adult may leave the box. And I don't ban the adults if they stand in the box because it could cause stress to them if they are preparing to nest or if they're roosting to nest. So usually I just leave single adults alone, especially if I think that they're nesting. Sometimes I won't clean at all. But like we can see here, there's this lone barn owl just sitting in a corner. So I actually just cleaned around her, left her on a little mound of her own pellet and a little bit of pellet mass around her. So if she was nesting, she had something to work with and then I left her be. And in special occasions, if there was chicks, we would get to band the chicks. It's the only time that you really get an opportunity to band barn owls because they're very elusive and can be very skittish around humans. But luckily, sometimes mom will stay with the chicks and we can band her too. On the right side of the screen, you can see me holding an adult barn owl while the assistant ornithologist, Amy Kearns, bands her. And she just stayed in the box while we banded her babies. So we grabbed her and took the opportunity to band her. We put her back in the box and she huddled around some babies and we made sure to stay around and she brought food to the babies and it all worked out. But nine times out of 10, we banned chicks, which is a really awesome opportunity to get to hold a baby barn owl and really appreciate the little fluff balls that they are. All right, so I want to show you the results of our survey. So I uncovered that little post-it note and you can see that there was 82 nests documented in 2022, which is a huge increase from our last survey. We are so, so excited and very proud of the barn owls that they have increased the population this much in the past 40-ish years. It's really fantastic to see how they're doing. And we partially believe it's because of the increase of barn owl boxes in appropriate barn owl habitat but there's also other theories possibly like no-till can be better for barn owls due to the lack of chemicals. And the fact that a lot of farmers are accepting barn owls and putting in these boxes. So there's multiple factors to this increase, but we can assume that most of the reason for the increase is for putting those boxes in the appropriate habitat. So I want to include you guys kind of show you what other things were in the nest box because I said there's sometimes not barn owls in the nest box. So occasionally we would have empty boxes, which is no problem. And then a lot of European starlings, which would be made up of straw, twine, grasses, rock pigeons, which were a pain. They were essentially made up of pigeon feces. So they're rock hard. Occasionally we would get American kestrel nest in the box, which is really awesome. Um, it's strange when American kestrels nest in the nest boxes because they prefer smaller cavities and the nest box is so huge. But we can tell that a kestrel has been in there because of their feathers, their pellets, and then occasionally we'd have an eggshell. And then the fun ones, the really fun ones were the small mammals. So sometimes I'd open the box and there'd be a family of squirrels in there or a shy raccoon. Um, I didn't have anything crazy besides some squirrels and a raccoon, but in terms of anything else, if we opened it, we cleaned it out of the box because that's a great way that we can manage these barn owl nest boxes is to just make sure that even if there's not a barn owl in there, we take out all the junk and we do take out the old nest boxes or let me rephrase that. We take out the old nests of barn owls from the box as well to make sure that they don't fill up and barn owls can't use them anymore. So that's why we do this survey every five years, because if we did it every year, the pellet mass wouldn't really accrue. And it, this survey takes a lot of time. 
like Robert mentioned, this survey had over 300 plus boxes all across the entire state of Indiana. So it was very, very difficult to do all these nest box checks. So we do this every five years to manage the nest boxes, make sure that everything comes out, and also just to not put pressure on the barn owls if they decide to nest in the winter. So this is a really, really fun picture that I was able to come up with. So this shows the occupancy of barn owl nest boxes. So I took this number by the number of nests divided by the total number of boxes in that county. So as you can see, a lot of Northern Indiana does not have any boxes or unfortunately had a box, but zero occupancy. Um, and you can really see this tight range here on the Southwest side where there's a lot of barn owls concentrated in the tip of the shoe, as I like to call it, um, for Indiana. And so this was really, really interesting for us to kind of see the counties around this really hot zone for barn owl nests to see what other counties do we need to focus on nearby. We can see that one county that's green is really close to an orange county. So we need to kind of focus on putting more barn owl boxes in that county to kind of see if we can up the numbers on that for the next survey. So that this is a really cool uh, graphic to show you guys. So in terms of continuing the Nest Box program, because they did do so, so well, we are going to continue to install barn owl box ne nest boxes, but we're only gonna do them in areas where there have been confirmed sighting of barn owls. We don't want to overpopulate an area with nest boxes. It wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing, but we don't want to overrun all these nest boxes with starlings and pigeons and encourage invasive species breeding. So we're only going to do it in areas that have sightings. We're going to do another survey in 2027-2028 to check on the population. And our overall goal is to remove barn owls from the state endangered list. And the criteria for that now is they have to have 80 nests in over a six county range which they hit this time. So if they hit it again in 2027, we can contact the bird advisory committee and see if we can take them off the list. And that would be the overall goal of the Nest Box program. So because you guys are in Illinois, I wanted to make sure that you guys also had some resources about barn owls. So as you can see, Illinois kind of follows this same trend that Indiana does where the southern half is really, really strong with barn owls. So this map specifically is of all the counties that have had a report of a barn owl nest from 1980 to 2010. So this was the only graphic that I could find for the Illinois DNR. So these counties, there has been at least one barn owl nest in the past 30 years since 2010. So if you want to find barn owls, I strongly recommend going to Southern Illinois, specifically grasslands and prairies, but farms are also really, really great. If the farm has at least eight acres, that's ideal and there's a really strong chance that there could be a barn owl there. It can be a dairy farm or agricultural lots. And I have to admit, Amish farms tend to be the best. And I think that might be because of their farming practices. The voles can really thrive there, which means the barn owls can really thrive there. So check around your Amish communities and your really rural areas to try to see a barn owl. Like I mentioned, listen, try to listen for a screech, not a hoot. And look, so a really good time to look for barn owls is during their breeding season when it's really, really warm. So I kind of took the strongest seasons for Indiana, which is April through September. Their breeding season can go from April all the way to late August. So those are their ideal times to kind of find barn owls. Um, and I thought it was really interesting that barn owls are scarce in Illinois, but they are not listed as endangered. They are just listed as population in, in decline. So I'm interested to see if the Illinois DNR is going to implement something like the nest box program to kind of up the numbers on the barn owls and maybe increase that range to go further north. So helping out the barn owls, I'm here to advocate for my birds. I love them so much. So of course you can donate to the Indiana non-game fund or you can help support your state and donate to the Illinois Wildlife Preserve Fund. You can also install your own nest boxes. So there is a diagram on the Indiana DNR website. If you just type in barn owl nest box, 
Indiana DNR, it'll pop up with a nice PDF for you to make your own barn owl nest box. We also have a live barn owl cam at one of our properties, which is really, really awesome. We have not, not had a nest in there since 93, I believe. So between April and August, if you log on to see the barn owl cam on the Indiana DNR website, you will more than likely see a barn owl. And it's really, really cool to see the progress as they lay the eggs and see the chicks. So this screenshot is actually from the barn owl cam last year. And I successfully banded five of her chicks from this box. So it was really cool. And we also have just the barn owl webpage, which gives you some more basic information on barn owls. And that is just on the DNR webpage as well. So I really hope you guys enjoyed this presentation about the barn owl population in Indiana. And I would love to answer any and all questions that you guys may have about this. All right. Well, thank you very much, Grace. Um, I think that was a great presentation. Um, I guess you can give her a round of applause. Does anybody have, and I'll monitor the chat here, does anybody have any questions here in the live audience? Yes. When did the boxes ship put up? So the question was, when do the boxes, or when were the boxes put up? That's a great question. So that varies a lot of the time. We have some boxes that were installed in the 80s, but what we do is we have a huge folder that has every single barn owl box on it with the coordinates, where it is, and what we found every single year. So sometimes we open a page and that box is from last year, and sometimes we open the page and the page is brittle and falling apart and it's from the 90s. So it really varies when the boxes were put up. Just this past year, I put up three more barn owl boxes. But like I said, some of them can be upwards of 30 years old. Yes. Where do, uh, where do they nest? Yeah, so the question was, where do they, and this is actually a question I had written down, where do they build their nests if they don't have boxes? That is a great question. So barn owls are cavity nesters. So they prefer to be in enclosed spaces. So they used to nest in old hollowed out trees, but with the increase of logging over the years, they lost a lot of that habitat and they moved more to barns, which is kind of how they got their name. They used to nest in the tops of the rafters or where the hay is in a barn. And then once we started giving them barn owl boxes, they moved out of those areas and into a safer area. Sometimes there's also barn owls in silos and grain bins. And those are the ones that we really wanna put a barn owl box up because we don't want them to get killed during harvest. Questions? There is a question here in the chat. Um, uh, if the barn owls are removed from the endangered species list, will the Indiana DNR continue the program? That is a really, really awesome question. So if they get removed from the endangered species yet list, yes, we will do the nest box program still, but it will probably be really, really narrowed down even more to what it is now. So if we get a report of a barn owl, and we take a look at our map and there's a nest box that's about a mile away, we may not put a nest box up and we might be a little bit more strategic about it, but we will still do the five-year surveys just to kind of maintain our data on the population because even though they just got off the list, they're still teetering on that line. So we still wanna make sure that they really, really get into that safe number. Um, are there any plans to, I know there were a bunch of counties that didn't have nests uh, or nest boxes in there. Are there any plans to add boxes to those counties or are you guys kind of waiting until there's a sighting? We are going to wait until there's a sighting. So we do that because barn owls are really, really 
sensitive to weather. They despise the cold. They cannot stand it. So anything below, I believe, 20 degrees, they are out of there. They do not like it at all. So that's why we try to stay away from the north, because if there is a sighting of the barn owl, it's probably just heading south anyways. So we try to avoid putting boxes up there just because the barn owls don't actively breed in the north. So um, another message in the chat says uh, the DuPage, uh, the DuPage Forest Preserve tried a couple introductions of barn owls and found that all the owls just moved out to the southern parts of the U.S. and did not come back. Um, so are any of the owls migratory in Indiana or are they residents? These are awesome questions. I'm really excited for these. So the answer is yes, there are some residents and then they do move. So barn owls are very individual owls. They are very, they can be sensitive to people. They may live in a barn that constantly has things going. So sometimes once we have a successful nest, mom and dad might boot out the chicks and they might leave and go other places to other states. Or mom and dad may leave and one of the chicks may stay there. Um, that's why we try to ban the chicks because if we do have a re-siding, and if we're really lucky, a re-siding of a band, then we can track where those owls are. But unfortunately, a re-siding of a band on a barn owl is really difficult. But if we're lucky, when we're doing these nest box surveys, we can excavate possibly a mummy of a barn owl that is banded. So the answer to the question is yes, they do migrate a little bit, not a lot, just a little bit. And there are resonant ones that might stay there for their whole lives. Um, another comment here. Um... Is there a good place and time to look for barn owls near Bloomington? Looks like they're going down there to visit soon. Which Bloomington? Assume Bloomington, Indiana. <laughs> so that's actually where I'm stationed out of. And we have nine to 10 boxes in Bloomington, or I should say Monroe County more specifically. And there was no barn owls, unfortunately. But if you go south just a little bit, Lawrence County, specifically if you go into the area, oh, what is that called? Mitchell. If you go into the area of Mitchell and you go into those grassland areas and Davies County, which also isn't too far in the Amish neighborhoods, there's a high chance that you may see a barn owl just hanging out, um, especially since it's been really warm the past couple of days here. So we might not have had a bunch of them leave yet because of the frost. But I would say Lawrence County. And if you're out there on the grasslands, might as well check to look for loggerhead shrikes too. There are loggerhead shrikes in Lawrence County. Those are the smallest carnivorous songbird. They are endangered in Indiana. Um, and they love um, pastures and farms and anyone that has their barbed wire up still. And a lot of Amish often have barbed wire up still. So if you see a cedar tree, barbed wire, take a look out for barn owls and shrikes. You may get lucky. Any other questions here? You know, I was just wondering how big of a clutch do they have? How many eggs do they normally? So yeah, the question was, uh, how many eggs do they typically lay? Great question. So on average, their clutch is about four to five. And on average, the success rate of that is two to three chicks for four to five eggs. Um, so about 50% survival rate on the clutch for those. And usually it's just one brood per season. Um, all right, this is a fun question. Why do shrikes like barbed wire? <laughs> <laughs> This might get us into the Halloween season. So <laughs> loggerhead shrikes are called the butcher bird. And because they are the smallest carnivorous songbird, they're still very, very tiny. And they can catch things like voles and mice, just like the barn owls do. 
So what they do is they catch the loggerhead or they catch the loggerhead, they catch the agricultural pest and they impale the pest onto the barbed wire where they can then sit on the other part of the barbed wire and just peck away at it. It's very delicious, a little treat. But that is why they liked the barbed wire. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions. So um, once again, Grace, thank you very much for speaking to our group. Um, we'll give you another round of applause. So thank you very much. Right, and if there's no further um, uh, business to attend to, the meeting is adjourned for the night. So thank you all again for joining us and uh, we hope to see you at the November meeting.